Welcome to the Nordic Mythology Podcast. I'm Daniel Farrand, on with the company Horns of Odin. As always, before the episode, I do have to shout out our Patreon. I know you're probably sick of hearing it by now, but it is literally how we keep the lights on without the Patreon. There couldn't be a podcast. So if you do get a chance, please pop over to Patreon forward slash Nordic Mythology Podcast. Works out at about 10 p a day, £3 a month, or it starts from £3 a month. And there's a bunch of cool inf- um, cool bonus material you get on there. So you get a Q&A episode every week with our guest that's recorded after the main show. It's basically just an extension of the main show. So if you like a particular episode, there will be some sort of extension on there. Um, and usually the patrons ask a lot of questions that maybe me or my Greth miss. And they're, uh, they tend to be a lot of fun. And on top of that, there's a couple of story time episodes we do every month and our creator episode. So honestly, just go go and have a look on the Patreon. It's it's well worth it. And you get the whole back catalog all the way back from when we started. So there's years of material at this point. And obviously not everybody can support financially. So even just a like, share, uh, comment, you know, play play with the algorithm. You, you know, we have to try and do that. And then a review wherever you listen to your podcast is also very beneficial. Beneficial, it helps new people find the podcast. So yeah, let's get into today's show. I'm looking forward to this one. So as always, I get. I, can I say as always? No, Margaret. I think you're a regular I, enough. Now we've I reached say, that point, always. haven't we? Yeah, as always. Uh, I'm joined by Margaret Havga. Um, Margaret, you can introduce our guest today. Yeah, we're joined by Mighty on the Moon, who is the head of the archaeology department at the Museum of Cultural History. She's also an archaeologist and coincidentally my boss. And I'm very excited <laughs> to have her here today. Oh, hi, Mighty on the How are you? Hi, Maurice. It's very lovely to be here today. Um, I don't think I'll be wearing my boss hat. I'll be, uh, I'll be the silly academic me today, which is yes. awesome. Yeah. I love um, that. You... Yeah, go ahead, Dan. No, no, you go. I was just going to say, do you want to... Just tell us shortly a bit about like your interests and and what you've done kind of in the archaeological side. Absolutely. Right. So um, I normally start with saying that I'm a terrible archaeologist because I've not actually done um, much field work since 2005, at which point I worked in Britain, um, contract archaeology. But then I uh, slowly worked my way back into academia through the roles of gender, gender archaeology. Um main interest ended up being the Viking Age. That's fun. Although I have to be quite honest and say that it could have been any period. It's just It just so happens that the Vikings are really easy to talk about from a gendered perspective. So, um, And also gender is here a euphemism for feminism. So I, I do feminist Viking Age studies, which is fairly niche. Um, on top of that, I also tend to look at mortuary material uh, for the main empirical basis. And I've dabbled in landscapes. And I've also dabbled in human sacrifice. So a fairly varied portfolio. And um, yeah, but, um, but as I was saying earlier on, uh, anything that I do dabble in does tend to come back to being about gender. Mm-hmm. So is, is that what the your focus or interest always was? You said it could have been any yeah, topic. Yeah, it could have been anything. <laughs> I did my undergrad in Edinburgh many years ago, and I did a um, uh, part of my master course where I was a... I credit in gender archaeology and um and i knew that was something that i wanted to carry on with but then you know academ- academia is fairly it's expensive in the uk mm-hmm. so i waited until we moved back to norway until i tried to make a go of it and at that point so like, i don't know what to study because obviously my focus when i was doing my undergrad was sort of celtic iron age and that kind of thing but there's not a lot of market for that in norwegian universities so mm-hmm. I'm probably digging my own grave very swiftly here, but I basically cast around and went, you know what, the Vikings, they're pretty awesome. I'll do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I have a feeling that a lot of us who deal with the Viking Age ended up with the Viking Age yeah. through some sort of similar path. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. They're just there, aren't they? It's, it's available and quite easy. Yeah. It is quite easy. Yeah. And fun. Uh, do, also mention. just... Just for anybody listening, Marianne is Norwegian. She just has the most convincing British accent and completely fooled me before <laughs> before, before the show. Um, so that kind of leads into my next question is, was there not... So I found this week, I got into a little bit of a discussion online about somebody was suggesting basically that 
if you're Scandinavian, you kind of automatically are interested in the Viking Age, and it's just this this thing that is there in like all Scan. It was the the argument. Oh, it wasn't really an argument, but the the talk was that almost as if like any Scandinavian or automatically had some sort of um, one up starting point on everybody else when it came to the Viking Age, just for because they were Scandinavian, and I'd, my point was like, nah, from my personal experience, that's not the case. And I, mm. that's why I was wondering with you being Norwegian, whether you led to the Viking Age because it's like, oh, that's kind of like my history rather than maybe the Roman period or the Greek. Do you know it's interesting? Um, no, I I don't think that was part of it, but, but it, it certainly is a point that, you know, if you, any Scandinavian will have a relationship with the Viking Age because, um, a lot of our history books, for instance, and in, in the school system, they, they start with the Viking Age, so we sort of taught it as part of our history. And that's a whole different thing that you could, you know, obviously talk about the nationalistic aspects of the Viking Age. But no, um, by the time I moved back to Britain, I'd spent um, uh, eight years in the UK. And um, I have to say, the Vikings were not part of my sort of um any any idea of identity or uh, or any sort of national connections with it at all to be quite honest i um one of the main reasons why i chose it was because i was interested in landscapes burials and women and the vikings did those really well that like that that connection with uh, burial monuments in the landscape and also being um also uh, the graves being fairly um about back then i would have said clearly gendered. Um, I have now changed my views of that quite considerably, but I suppose that's an academic journey for you. So it was more that than anything else. But um, I think there certainly is something in that Scandinavians will automatically have a relationship with the Viking Age, and many people will have it as part of their sort of collective national identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, so you said that the academic journey, like it's changed in, in what way? How is... Oh. How's that kind of the transition from? Um, right. So I started out wanting to look at um, uh, women's roles in as it, as they're depicted in the archaeological material, as compared to the story we're told about women's roles in many of the stories of the Viking Age, which. As I'm sure many people know, frankly, just don't measure up because we're told all these things about how gender roles were enforced in the Viking Age, and then the archaeological material tells us something quite different if we care to look at it. So that was sort of the start of it. And um, when I was doing my uh, master's at the University of Oslo um, a few years back, it was quite actually it's a very long time ago, now it's 14 years, um, I was using gender indicators uh, on my material. And I carried on doing that when I started doing my PhD as well. So in my PhD, um, my database, for instance, is is uh, split into male, female, and indeterminate graves. Um, but and, that, and that's obviously convenient when you're trying to talk about gender and, and how it configures in the burial record. And and it and it does configure in the burial record. But what I came to realize as I was doing my PhD is that actually most of the graves aren't gendered at all, and we don't talk about them. Uh, so that's where I've ended up being really interested is that we we have this idea of the Viking Age as a place where, you know, men had beards and axes and women had oval brooches and long gowns. Um, and that is true, but it's only part of the story because that's only a very, well, it's not the majority of the burial material. Um, the majority of the burial material doesn't clearly communicate gender at all. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of where I ended up being really quite fascinated by the fact that, you know, if you go to a museum or you read a book or you look at a reconstruction drawing, you will see men with beards and axes and women with these special types of gowns. Um, whereas the vast majority of people weren't buried like that at all. And we don't have that as part of our analytical, it, it doesn't enter into the analytical material that we base our stories on. That's what I'm mm. trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm probably quite guilty of that because I, I think when i if I, when i go to a museum and i see a skeleton my i just automatically go oh, i was probably a, a man and i don't know whether is that me because i am a man or is that me just being a sexist pig okay. uh, it's, it's you <laughs> being told by you're the problem then <laughs> yeah. 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 Just you. i don't mean but to do it, it. 
<laughs> I don't mean to. It's 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 a subconscious thing. Um, uh, yeah, no, but it isn't. Um, it's um, it's interesting you should say that because that, that's part of the problem that we have. Is obviously we we expect um, that the standard which we live by is is that people should be men, and if they aren't, then they're slightly problematic because they're women. Uh, but at least we know where they fit. And if they aren't clearly women or men, then you know it becomes a massive problem, especially when it comes to narrating the past. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how easy is it to tell, archaeologically speaking, like whether it's male, female, or or gender in like in general? Um, because that is such a good question, Dan, and that is such a complicated question. Yes, <laughs> Please go ahead, <laughs> uh, Yes, three hours later, you'll all be crying for me to stop. No, right. So it is very, very complicated. Uh, first of all, you need to decide what country you're in. If you're in Norway, um, which, you know, I am, uh, you don't have the skeletal material. So that means that you're reduced to deducing gender from uh, grave goods. Uh, and that means is that, that you're back. Sorry, just just like a little. Is that because um, of the ground that yeah. the skeletal material doesn't survive? Soil conditions are just really okay. terrible for uh, skeletal preservation in Norway. Although, really interestingly, it's a lot better up north where you do get um, a fair few preserved skeletons. But okay. uh, down south, where we're based, um, Magreth and I, there's very little skeletal material. You do get the old one, like the Ulsberg skeletons and, and Gokstar, but that's because they were buried in mounds of clay, which basically you know, preserves anything. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, there uh, there isn't a lot. Also, a lot of the graves are cremated and uh, osteologically sexing cremations. I know technically it can be done, but it, uh, it's not easy. Okay. So that's your first problem. So in Norway, most graves that you hear about from the Viking Age will be what we used to call, and I still think we do to an extent, call archaeologically gendered, which means that you look at the things that the person is buried with and, and then you decide what it is from that. Now, mm -hmm. fun fact is that the way that we gender burials from the Viking Age, i.e. by saying that weapons means it's a man and yeah. jewelry means it's a woman, was is a method that heals back to the 1830s in Germany, where it was first written down. And the justification they gave for thinking that weapons should be buried with men and jewelry with women is that that was very appropriate in 1830s. And we still mm -hmm. use it. Okay. So, yeah, that's it's a <laughs> bit of a challenge. In other countries, like Denmark, you do get a lot more skeletal material. But what you get less of is the grave goods. So there's this massive study from 1984, which we still use as a reference guide to um, gendering Norwegian graves. And in that, it is perfectly true that where there is gender-specific grave goods, such as jewelry and weapons, they do correlate to an osteologically sexed body of the expected gender. But, and here comes the big but, and this is what I was talking about earlier when what I discovered when I was doing my PhD, out of 380 odd skeletons, uh, 20 of them correlate with grave goods and skeletons because most of them only have like a knife and it's not gender specific. So we've made a really whole story low of... number. Okay. <laughs> it's a really, really low number. It's less than 10% of burials that conform to female bodies buried with jewelry and male body, bo bodies buried with mm -hmm. swords. So you have this whole... On, on, on a quick little side note, because um, yeah. I'm a pain for that, I'm sorry. Uh, how many, when it comes to like burials that we find, how many would conform to being, say, a warrior? Because I think this is the idea that everyone has this idea that you find a burial, it's a warrior. Yeah. Um, and I'd love to know the percentage of like how many just general burials we find. I can't give you the number of warriors found uh, in... One of the main problems that we have in Norway is that we don't have a national database of, uh, of all our burial material, at least not one that's searchable and easily accessible. Um, a rough estimate of the like, number of Viking Age burials known be about eight to 9,000. But uh, this is based on uh, guesstimates, basically, which isn't all that accurate. So, and out of those, the percentages buried with specific types of um goods I, I honestly i don't know i wish i did okay that's a fair fair answer i'd rather always rather that answer than 
<laughs> make one up. Um, <laughs> make one out. Yeah, I did. Uh, yeah, it's just one of those things that I kind of I wondered whether it's a lot or not many. No, it's or... not. It's, it's it's not a lot. I mean, and if you're talking about, um, you'd need to qualify what a warrior is as well. So, what would a warrior be buried with? Okay. What would it be? A sword and a spear and an axe and a shield? Because in that case, not a lot at all. Would an axe be enough? In that case, an awful lot. But if you okay. say an axe is enough, then you've got a gender problem because a lot of women are buried with axes. Um, so that goes against most of the traditional stories as well. So um, there's a lot of levels that you need to decide um, to get to that kind of number. Yeah. So if if you have this like such certainly, I I find like a fascination amongst like that shield made a strong female figure. That's what people most people I would say as like a, a lay person, they when they think of the Vikings, you think of like strong female characters um so if that exists within all of this how come we have this huge leaning towards uh graves just automatically being sexed as male if found with any sort of weaponry um that's again these are very good questions um and and they're quite complicated there might be an interest in popular culture with women and weapons in the Viking Age. What we have seen um, with the advent of the BJ581 and Bidka is that academically, there is not much interest in women with weapons. In fact, it causes many, many, many strong feelings. Okay. Uh, and that in itself is very interesting. So I suppose it's because when you're an academic and you devote your life to the Viking Age, you do end up with feelings of ownership to that period. And then when empirical data comes up that doesn't necessarily flatter your version of the Viking Age, it might be difficult to deal with. So mm -hmm. I think there I, is... I, I was going to say, I was, I was about to ask that, whether do you think that plays a part that almost we live in this time that the whole world feels like uh, like a kinder box ready to just ignite at the minute and whether that played into it of putting something out that could be seen as quite controversial, whether it would kind of, I don't know, be received well or do people maybe just avoid it because it's easier at it, if that even plays into it no i'm i'm not i mean yeah it probably does on some level because you know knowledge is never produced in a vacuum and we we are shaped by the time that we live in in many ways and obviously the bitka debate is very much a product of its particular time um mm -hmm. and positioning in space and time um I don't know. I do find it interesting that in sort of amongst the general public, there is much more willingness to accept different stories of the past than there are in some corners of academia. Mm -hmm. um, but then I know also, and that's full disclosure, that many people find me difficult because I don't believe in a past. I think we always create the past and the present and that the stories we tell of the past are the stories that we choose because they flatter our present or they tell us who we want to be. So I just, um, um, I suppose I'm the worst kind of relativist in the sense that, you know, I just don't believe there is a Viking age that isn't created by us in the here and now. Mm -hmm. And it reflects us more than I it mean, reflects Vikings. I personally just want to say, preach. <laughs> yeah, I am that. very much on board with this. And especially <laughs> also like the fact that, um, there likely isn't a objective Viking Age right. past, even if we could come to some sort of interpretation of what that was like. There there would be as many types of Viking Ages as there were people and lived experiences in the Viking exactly. Age. Mm -hmm. And then even if you were to get like those hundreds of thousands of different voices, you would still have to understand them. So you would still have yep. to put them into your own frames of reference. So the mm -hmm. idea of a story of the past is... I think completely fictional. Mm -hmm. Do you, I often I, I love when somebody says something that that I've never thought about, and then it makes me instantly go, "I know, I I agree with that because yeah, everything is looking back through our lens and our um, yeah. experiences, I guess. And also, I've always been very skeptical when you're trying to boil down. 300 ish years into like one group of like people that yeah. cover a huge geographical 
location. It's like, you know, everybody's struggling with different things all over. And to kind of put that all down into one thing seems very um, basic. I know t- times probably don't change as quickly back then as they do today. But if you look at it, just in my lifetime, the, the things that have changed yeah. um, in just, just what's socially acceptable from when I was, so I'm, I'm 35. So I think I've, I've grown up in a time that's seen what, what one thing that you can say and is very, uh, very accepted when I was a kid that is just wildly not accepted now. And I think just in my lifetime, from being at school to now, there's a lot of things that have just changed completely mm. um, and what is socially acceptable. So just in my, just in those 10 years, if you then put that into across, you know, how the hundreds of years of the Viking age, it must have changed drastically what, what you, not, not necessarily what you can and can't say, but just the, the whole cultural aspect must have been wildly different. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so when I try and describe the Viking Age in a few words, which is obviously not easy, but I always try and say that it's a, it's a time in transition where everything was changing. Um, so, you know, the start of the Viking Age, around about 750, has got, it's got so little to do with the end. Uh, trying mm-hmm. to talk about it as, you know, a time when people thought and felt the same things, I just I don't think that works at all. And also, yeah. I mean, who are people? Um, it, can you compare an elite, um, wealthy, uh, free person to somebody who's enslaved? I mean, you, you just can't. The, the range of social experiences is so diverse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think we often forget that they're people. They have personalities. Yes. And, yes. you know, what I do, you know, in my house compared to like maybe my neighbor, not that I do anything weird in my house. Yeah. That sounded really, that sounded really, really weird. Do that. Uh, what do you do in your house? I know. That's not, that didn't mean that to come across. <laughs> do tell, like that. Dan. Please share. Yeah. <laughs> but what I mean is what, what I do to like my neighbor or like somebody down the road, we're different people. We enjoy different things. We have different hobbies. And, you know, that would be not much different. People enjoy different things. We're, we're all human with our own thoughts and feelings. Yeah. But we kind of just boil it down to a person or a, a role, I guess. And Yeah, roles is what we talk an awful lot about archaeologically. You know, what social role mm-hmm. did this person play? And okay, then we decide yeah. they have one and then we're done and we're very pleased with that. It's like, <laughs> yes, but in the course of the day, I go through, I don't know how many different social roles I enact, um, mother, academic, boss, um, mm-hmm. partner, um, owner, because they have a dog. Yeah. Um, you know, these are all social roles that I flip through in the space of an hour, uh, and they're just sort of the outwards one. That I, I did very complicated stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, back to gender. In- yes in the Viking age. So, okay. So we stick with, um, this kind of shield maiden figure, I guess, seeing as we, we would be with there. How accurate do you think that model is? Because it is, and on the back of that, why do you think there is such a a fascination with it in modern times of, because I'm trying to, because I'm trying to make the, the questions more simple without them being too broad, but then I keep piggybacking on the back of it because something else comes, else comes to mind. Because um, yeah. I feel like there is this really romanticized viewpoint of the Viking Age of how women were equal and everything was just very la da and nice for women. And, and it is this kind of image that I think the, the everyday person has of like the Viking Age was just better than any other time uh, for, for women. Um, yeah. Can I Wherever interject, you think is best to start. Can I interject there and be a real dick and ask another question that we can start with before you get there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm really curious uh, about, I mean, I've, I've read a lot of your work, but on this, so I do kind of know, but at the same time, I'm also really yeah. interested just to um, hear your thoughts on when we say man and woman today we have a very specific Uh thing that that means and we do know that most likely fairly similar words were used at the time yeah but okay 
I'm going to, I'm going to be a real douche here and frame it <laughs> in a weird way. But like, do you think that the, what a man, the word man now means is necessarily directly transferable to what man or woman meant back then? And then we can go back to shield maidens. Cause I'm really interested to get your pick on that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm very glad you asked that. No, I think that's again a complete um, utter simplification. I'm such a suck up, Margaret. <laughs> no, but we've had this conversation <laughs> sure. so many times. <laughs> so, I'm sure, okay. This ends up being more your territory than mine. But I think um, in today's society, we are body obsessed. So when mm. you say man, you think dick. And when you say woman, you think a womb mm. on two legs. Mm -hmm. And that is just how we are conditioned because our understanding of sex is so rooted in this idea of biology that we can't really see any other way of being. And to us, to have a gendered identity that isn't based in our genitalia seems very, very alien. And obviously that's now changing, which is brilliant, and we're moving towards a more interesting society, which is fantastic, but it still applies to the past. So when we describe ways of being gendered in the past, we still equate them to bodies. And so this is where you get up on the nice, because then people are like, yeah, but are you saying they didn't have bodies in the past? I'm like, no, I'm not saying they didn't have bodies in the past. Obviously they have bodies in the past, but I don't think that they rooted their identities in their bodies in the same way that we do. And especially not the Viking age. And this is where I go into your territory, Magdeta, because, you know, sexed gender, no, sorry, uh, dressed gender and, and body gender can be two widely different things. And I think that's something that we see in the Viking Age is that gender doesn't necessarily equate to bodies. Now, I do think that they knew and recognized male and female bodies, but I don't think that your male and female gender had to um, correlate with that. Yeah. <laughs> you're not, you're just... not loving that. No, it's not that I'm not loving it. I'm just trying to... Um, I think Dan is just, he's just updating the software yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> in his head. Um, because I do think that that's something that's so ingrained in us today. And I think that that's, um, I'm going to be very generalistic here because there are obviously, um, you know, uh, exceptions to the rule. But I think that's one part of the development of archaeology as a field specifically. That's very unfortunate that we're so rooted in this biological version of what gender is and also mm. just not uh kind of taking um having any space for the divergences that do appear yeah. biologically between oh, the sexes so our understanding archaeological sex is basically based on a 1950s utopia where there were just men and women and the women wore dresses and the men you know were men um, and it doesn't really seem like the categories we use have updated in the time that has passed since, which is wildly unfortunate. But then also, um, Dan was saying earlier how when we were growing up, because I'm, I'm older than you, so I'm, I guess I can probably counter your stories with language that we used, which were absolutely appropriate in the 90s, that it's now absolutely mm -hmm. just you know, so horrific. But um, it's not that long ago since we got the third box to tick on forms, for instance. So, you know, yeah. the first I remember thing that. you do to identify yourself is are you a man or a woman? When I was pregnant with my son, the first question anybody asked me would be like, is it a boy or a girl? Mm -hmm. I'd be like, well, it's a baby and I hope it's human. Um, and then, you know, the list goes on. Yeah, he was, he's fine. Um, <laughs> not a cat, would have been a disaster. Anyway, <laughs> um, sorry. Point being, we still think identity is dictated by our bodies. We just can't, we can't stop thinking that way. But uh, mm -hmm. this is not about the Viking. Well, it is about the Viking Age because it's about our stories of the Viking Age, which tends again to rely on our stories of ourselves. Yeah. Um, but where were and, we? And then, kind of like basing off of that, then we can get into the whole shield maiden thing. Shield maiden. Yes. Yeah. So oh, I don't know. I have. I think we're. Oh, you're, you're, I'm sorry. Did you, did, were you catching up just now? <laughs> so it, yeah, I've been processing. Um, okay, so what do you think the focus was on if it wasn't on on their bodies? Um, what would they kind of identify with if that's the right word? Would it be like their job role or, mm. or, or 
yeah, how would that? Yeah, no. So I think I, th- I think bodies did play a part, obviously, um, because of you know um, reproduction and all of that. Um, but I think social status was more important okay. than gender. Uh, but also your family situation. So you know, we we have many sources that, that testify to that if a um, if a household only had daughters, then one of those daughters could take on a, a more male role, um, mm-hmm. and that's fairly widely testified to. Uh, we also know that in many circumstances, um, women could could act in more typically male roles, and that doesn't seem to have been very um, rare. In fact, it seems to have been very common. So. It does seem like circumstance and social status, opportunity, family, like kind of those kind of things would uh, would dictate quite a lot of who you could be. And then I also think, um, I do think that they had male and female ways of being, but I think that you could transgress that regardless of body if you um, if you had sort of the social status and uh, and the opportunities behind you. You said if. Um... If if a family only had daughters, then the daughter could then would would that then not lead into that there is some sort of there is a concept gender of hierarchy, gender. I guess. No, but there is a gender hierarchy, and I, and I think um, I think that's fairly widely recognised. What I don't think is that it's static, and I don't think that it's biologically determined in the same way. So I think there are again, I think there were ways of being gendered. I don't think they were rooted in bodies in the same way that they are for us. Okay. I mean, there's this really interesting quote, and this is very unprofessional of me because I don't have the source right in front of me, and I don't <laughs> remember exactly where saga it's from. And again, sagas are problematic, but also useful, uh, getting that all the w- out of the way. But there is a line somewhere, and I'm gonna, ugh, I, I'm gonna use this myself, so I need to find it again. But there is a quote from somewhere that says something along the lines of, and please correct me if I'm misremembering this, Mariana, if you know what I'm talking about. But it says something al- along the lines of, I'd rather have a daughter who is a son than a son who is dishonorable or something like that. Oh, yeah. yeah and like even that, about. even okay, that, yeah. I haven't had the time to like dive into this. But then I'm like, oh, so now we're even just talking about the concept of pronouns. <laughs> mm-hmm. That is really interesting. And that that entails a whole different thing. So son, like just playing off that son doesn't necessarily equate dick. Yeah, like, no, it doesn't. It really, it doesn't. And that's the thing that we, I think, we see it in the archaeological material as well. So yes, there are graves where there are female bodies buried with, you know, full jewelry and textile equipment. And yes, there are male burials that are buried with swords and shields and spears, spears and the whole package. But they're only a very small percentage of what we actually have. Most of them share a lot of um, grave goods. They are buried in similar ways, following the same rituals, buried under the same kind of monuments. It doesn't seem to be as strictly gendered as those few graves would lead us to believe, and it doesn't seem to be as strictly gendered as the traditional narratives would have us believe. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Um, but I, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm trying to play somewhat devil's advocate, so don't hold me. No, please this. do. Um, no, no, that's fine. <laughs> if if we have, I know you say we, 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 there's only so many of these graves that we can accurately sex, uh-huh. but if if it leans to uh, X amount is the ones with the the weapons tends to be men, and uh-huh. then the the X amount is the ones with the the textiles and jewelry tends to be to be women. Would it not be kind of right to assume that out of the ones that we found and managed to sex that that would then kind of move forward because obviously you you, you only find a, a very small percentage of what it was actually buried. Um, so you, would it not be right to use them to then kind of um, kind of as a ratio to go okay with well, this kind of percentage, and would that be pub 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 pub? Why cast problematic? problematic? Why why was I putting an L in there? <laughs> oh, problematic was that? For, uh, would that be pro- would, would that be problematic? Um, <laughs> I don't think so. Because but we depending need to on what about. you found. Yeah, no, no, no. I don't think it is problematic. I don't think so it was so at all. But I think you need to talk about the other graves as well. That's what we tend mm-hmm. not to do. So we're like, ah, oh, right. in the Viking age, we have men, we have women. And you're like, yes, but 
And the so when I was doing my thesis, it was only a small sample. It was two hundred and eighteen groups. Twenty five percent of them couldn't be gendered. That's twenty five percent. Twenty five percent of people being buried without gender markers. And so you end up going, why don't? Why are we talking about them? Why are we only mm -hmm. talking about the ones who conform? And out of those graves, um, even though. And this was this. These were graves without any skeletal material that without just had objects. Material. Yes, yeah. just objects. So even if you were to you look at just the gendered graves, if you disregarded the swords and the brooches, they still had an awful lot in common, more in common than they have apart. So they were buried with very much the same kind of assemblage, and then maybe a spear or a brooch thrown in on top. And yet we choose to talk only about that spear and that brooch, and we disregard all the other. Um, material that could tell us that actually these social roles are a lot more complex. Um, yes, also, no osteological material in that sample, which leads to this hilarious catch 22 where you read site reports that goes out of these 22 graves. Uh, there were um, seven men, we know that because they were buried with swords. And isn't it interesting how the, the, there are no swords buried in female graves? And you're like, no, but you decided that those seven graves were men because they had mm -hmm. swords. Okay, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, a circular you... argument. Barry. Okay. Um I think I'm getting my head around it. <laughs> so... I mean, this is a very conceptual thing though, because you do I I'm doing this a lot like in real time at the mm -hmm. moment, just like sitting there and kind of like I know what I think is interesting and what the material shows, but also just like just kind of unlearning a little bit and realizing how ingrained this thinking is in us. Mm -hmm. It is ingrained. And I, uh, I had a lot of people getting very upset with me when I was like, when I was just going, but swords aren't important. And they're like, no, swords are important. I'm like, yes, okay, fine, swords are important. But so are frying pans. Let's talk <laughs> about frying pans. Do you know what? Nobody is really interested in talking about frying pans from the Viking Age, which seems like an awful way. It's they're not just as cool, are they? I guess. They're not. Um, they're not as sexy. But so I well, it depends who's holding the frying pan. Mm. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah, so anybody bear with me when I'm asking questions because a lot of this I am trying to figure out in real time. So sometimes I might mix my mix my words up. Um, and I mean, that's part of the process though, isn't it? Yeah, it is just kind of, yeah, process it all kind of as I'm, as I'm thinking of the question. So my next question was that, that kind of just came up with then. Um, if you have this group of women who were buried with cloth and jewelry and then like this group of men that were, that was uh, buried with weapons. Why? I, I can understand, okay, the men were buried with weapons because they were warriors, they were held in high regard. So we, that we be assume true? they were warriors because okay. they had weapons. Okay, yes. Okay, Sorry, but no, I, but I, was, I, I was meaning <laughs> as in, um, I could understand why they would get a more special burial because if they was held in high regard, then they would be, be buried with maybe important art, art, items that usually you would hold on to like a sword because you know a sword is important you're not going to bury somebody with it i guess unless they really need that sword wherever they're going um so would that be the same for the the, the i guess quote unquote like quote unquote special gendered female ones um would they be somebody who was held in high regard and that's why they're then buried with these extra goods and then yeah. Would that then kind of go back to what you were saying earlier about how really it's about hierarchy? You get these two groups who are buried special because they're they're held in high regard, and then this whole middle ground, just unfortunately, it's just mediocre people who just kind of just with well, the majority of people they just existed and they just didn't get anything more special. So unfortunately, you can't identify them based on. Yeah, so that's a really good argument, and um, and I can't say for sure for the whole of the archaeological corpus in Norway, but uh, in in the graves that I've analysed, no, that's not the case. The the ones that aren't gender specific are still really rich. You know, they've got horses and they've got lots of fancy tools and lovely things. Oh, okay. Um, so they're not poor. Um, I think there's something else going on there. Mm, um, yeah, I wonder what. Really good I, farmers. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> fun caveat, the richest biologically sexed female burial that we do have, Osberg, uh -huh. does not have any oval brooches. We assume uh -huh. that they were taken during the break-in, but we don't know whether or not they were actually there to begin with. Yeah. 
I, I don't assume they were taken during the break in. Um, I, um, we place a lot of faith in the jewelry sets of the Viking Age, which is actually they're not that common in burials. Textile working tools are very common, and that's fairly self-explanatory because the Viking Age couldn't have happened without textiles. Um, so that's that makes perfect sense. Oval brooches aren't that common, and um, we, we sort of we expect them, and uh, when they aren't there, we get a little bit upset. But um, they're not really; they shouldn't be expected. Um, is the long and the short of that. But um, but I just think we need to explore social roles that aren't tied to these very Victorian gender ideals, because that's what they are, really. When we dig up a woman, we're like, oh, she doesn't have any jewellery, so she can't have been a proper woman. Oh, well, that doesn't sound like very 2024 reasoning to me, does it? <laughs> no. Um, what, would, every, would the everyday person have had like high quality jewelry or would it no. just be but the graves that we have aren't everyday people we only have eight thousand from the whole of norway so we're missing most of the graves for 300 okay. years eight thousand people eight, divided by um, three that's not a representational number ish it's just not so i could do the maths but uh, it would take me some time <laughs> but it's basically so, it, it, it would mean like a tiny population would that be the case that because again i don't know that much or anything about this stuff um is that the case the most graves that we find are somebody who is of some importance are yeah. they buried in a certain way that means that we find them because i guess i would have just assumed that we just found pretty much a little bit of everybody some like everyday people who maybe would just yeah. fell over and died or, oh, no, I wish. Uh, and then to like yeah I wish. No, unfortunately, most of the graves that we find are very definitely wealthy people on of some scale or another. I mean, you can't compare them because some of them are Augsburg, which is, you know, the richest grave that we mm -hmm. know of. And some of them are not that great. And they have, you know, an axe and maybe a sickle and part of a cow or something. That is still a lot of wealth, sort of relatively speaking. So um, getting to my point here, I think one of the reasons why we don't find more burials is uh, part of it part of it is the uh, terrible preservation of the skeletal material in Norway so if you weren't buried with stuff we're not going to find you because most of the graves okay. we have is from people's stuff mm -hmm. but then another thing is Norway has a fairly unfortunate topography in the sense that only three to four percent uh, is arable and unfortunately the arable land is also where people lived in prehistory and where they lived is where they buried people so an awful lot of our prehistoric archaeology is decimated by agriculture. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that's um, just the way it is, kind of. It's just the way mm -hmm. it is, and you know we can't do anything about that because we have such limited space on which to, which to grow any crops. Got to eat. Yep. Yep. Okay. I guess then, how I, I guess how accurate, if at all, can we? say about the average person living in the Viking oh, right. age, if, if everything that we go on seems to be, because if you were, I mean, I assume for, for the most people, it's just the, the hustle of life. You're just having to survive it. Like it's easy. It's easy for us to sit here and have this conversation and talk about um, gender a thousand years ago or me to sit on Instagram scrolling and posting or, you know, anything that we do without time, just getting into Facebook arguments. Like I always think like getting into Facebook arguments um, is such a sign of privilege of our time because we don't have to think about where the food's coming from, where going out and like uh, harvesting the crop or what, you know, we just don't have those things so we can spend our time. Mm -hmm. Whereas people, you know, back then, they just didn't have that luxury. So I imagine like for the everyday, it was just, you just have to hustle and get on with life. So you don't have yeah. time for all these things that we maybe associate with them and think were important. And they're just like, you know, we didn't even think about that because we just, we're trying not to starve to death. Exactly. And I think that's a, a massive part of that. And you only know, think about, so the traditional story of the Viking Age is that women um, looked after everything indoors and men looked after everything else outdoors. And you're mm -hmm. like, but that is not how a subsistence farmer could function. Um, I mean, they would starve to death if the if the wife in the household just sat down and went, no, I'm so very sorry, but I can't help you harvest the crops because that's outdoors and I'm only allowed to work indoors. 
So it there's does... this whole level of privilege in the stories that we tell about the past that are just not compatible with mm. having to make a living. Yeah, it does seem very silly that yeah. you wouldn't utilize an extra pair of hands when you're really hungry because you're like, sorry, you're a it's woman. Wrong realm. This, I mustn't go outdoors. This, this isn't your job. You you please just go back inside. Like, I, yeah, it just wouldn't make sense. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I, yeah I, I definitely think that that would have been the case. Like, everybody would share share the roles and do I guess just muck in and, and get on with everyday everyday life um, but then when it comes to I guess the the more elites the ones that we do have the evidence for or, or, or let, let's go back to warriors mm. do you think like it would have been particularly acceptable for, for women to become warriors like that that role I know that's uh, probably a that's a big question. <laughs> Not an easier question to answer. No. Um, so, so I, I've had a couple of chats with uh, Leshek Gadewa yeah. on, about, and I, it's always fascinating talking to to him about kind of this thing. And I love getting other people's perspective on it. Um, and yeah, just it's it's just such a hot topic, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Everyone seems to have an opinion on it, whether and like there's. There's no way to really say either way, I guess. No, no. I mean, I don't have a problem being forthright, uh, as Leszek knows as well. We don't necessarily see eye to eye on this either, but I'm like, if it, if it looks like a female warrior and it smells like a female warrior and it's buried with weapons and it is a woman, then it probably was a female warrior. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't really think that's problematic. I don't think it was a social role open to many women, but I also don't think it was a social role necessarily open to all men. Okay, so you yeah. need to qualify the questions that you're asking in terms of how many people could really inhabit that role. We don't have an awful lot of female warrior burials. We do have some. We have enough for it to not be unknown. And we also have plenty of other sources that testify to this being something that people knew and accepted. I don't think it was as common for women as for men, but I definitely don't think it was an impossibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that was a, a that's a, a fascinating point because, um, I don't think this is controversial, but not all people are made equal, um, no. and that might upset some people, but it is what it is. Um, so like, there's cer- there's certain things that I can't do because physiologically that I'm just not I'm I'm never going to be a basketball player in the NBA. I'm five foot ten and I can't jump very high, so no. that's just not a, a path for me to go down. So. I think that's fascinating because kind of going back to what we said before about the farms, um, do you think there would be any care if you had a female warrior who was really good and then you had like a male warrior who just wasn't that good because there will have been something that good. Do you think there would ever be like, oh, well, I'm not fine only with you because you're a woman. Or surely it's like you fight with the best. Yeah, I think so. Again, it's just pragmatic, isn't it? Because you're in a life or death situation. You're not going to really worry about the gender of the person you're going to worry about whether or not they'll stop you getting killed mm-hmm. um yeah 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 i i would I definitely agree with that <laughs> I, know, <laughs> I know what i would do basically uh but it is a very complicated question um in many ways but i just think we've got too much too much evidence to say otherwise and no mm-hmm. reason to suppose that women couldn't be warriors there is also no reason to suppose that they could be warriors as often as men could but that's a whole yeah. different story. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess that ties into the shield maiden question. Yeah. From earlier. Yes, shield maiden. Because Generally, I mean, that... no, go go ahead, my no, 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 I was just going to say that it, it's not actually a new thing. People have been obsessed with shield shield maidens for as long as Viking studies have been a thing. Mm-hmm. So it's about two hundred years of history of people really wanting shield maidens or really not wanting shield maidens or thinking they are just methodological creations or thinking they're based in reality and we still haven't gotten any closer to any sort of agreement do you think that's also what brings the fascination to it because it is such an open topic i often say this with the i guess the viking age in general i think it always sticks around in popularity and always kind of has this cycle of just coming back 
um, into popular culture because there is just so much open end that people can apply it to their own lives. People can kind of look at it and really identify with it and kind of become, yeah. you know, part of it. And I, and I think that is the joy of it because it is so malleable and interpretable to kind of interpretable. Yeah, maybe is that a word? Uh, into into yourself. So you think that is the same thing with human because there is no yeah. answer that it's just this ever ending cycle, never any cycle. Yeah, no, I think um, I I think that's yeah, you got a very good point there. Um, it's part of the attraction that the past holds, and especially the Vikings because they are close enough to feel familiar, but far enough away so that we can project pretty much any fantasy onto them, mm-hmm. and that creates a very interesting sort of fantasy realm doesn't that and there's a lot that could be said about that but yes i uh but yeah i think there's that's definitely something to do with that what about um like i guess female figures in mythology i don't know if that's your area as such or is it more just archaeological yeah like... i tend to i mean i do sometimes refer to written sources but i like to refer to what other people have written about written sources because i'm not that great okay. with them yeah okay um, yeah, it was just because obviously there are some quite important figures. Um, mm. Female, and I just wondered how that maybe whether we can take from that and look at how what society would be like because of how female figures were portrayed in. Yeah, no, I think mythology. you definitely can do that, and I think it, it reveals something quite different from, for instance, later Christianity. You know, so there is a there's a whole different way of seeing the world, and if you look at like the Norse creation myths then they're not um, not hostile to women in the same way as the Christian creation myth is, for instance. Uh, And I think that, again, tells you something about how society was understood, but also how um, how gender roles was understood. So, yes, I I do think there's a a lot there, but it isn't my strength. So, you know, I I might be talking myself into a corner, but um, (laughs) I don't think so. I don't think so. (laughs) Okay. Also, Margaret, if you have anything to ask, please jump in. I, I feel like I I'm mean, just... I was just, when when we were on the topic of, like, warriors and shield men's, kind of going back to our earlier talk about, you know, how likely the 1830s started the whole yeah. uh, interpretation of binary genders and, and sex in in the the viking age i'm curious and i mean there's i'm just spitballing here but i'm curious also since you said money on that uh that you know fascination with shield maidens have been around since as long as viking studies have been around mm-hmm. i do wonder if shield maidens okay it's a two-part thing this is just <laughs> me speculating it's tough isn't it <laughs> it is because there's like so much going on in my head at the same time i do wonder if the fascination with with shield maidens has started out because it has been seen as such a bananas concept mm. compared to what was currently going on at the time when Viking Age studies started and have kind of persisted that way since. And I also do wonder if it's been sustained by the fact that the Viking Age as a concept has been abused by a lot of right-wing, very white supremacist strict conservative movements that project very what we would call traditional but i wouldn't even call it traditional i would call it like uh, just kind of insane binary gender roles and so shield maidens kind of become the symbol of fighting that a bit i don't know whether or not there's any proof in what I'm saying, but I'm just kind of spitballing. That's really interesting. I don't know either, but I'd love for somebody to do some research on it, because I think there is definitely, there are some very unhealthy strains of how people relate to the Viking Age, and then there's a lot of sort of reactions against that, which also create um, and sustain a lot of the focus. I think certainly 19th century fascination with chill maidens, I I think it's fair to say there was a bit of exoticism in that, yes. Um, some of them were fairly straightforward though. So it's really interesting that um, one of the burials in Norway that has been osteologically assessed as female, um, um, she was 
excavated, or they, because we don't actually know, even though the osteological sex estimation isn't actually all that accurate. They were excavated in 1901, and the excavator Gustav Merck wrote just completely matter-of-factly, like, here is a shield maiden, you can see, because it is a woman, she has weapons, full stop. Uh, no hoo no big debates, everything, everybody was just like, yeah, okay, that's a shield maiden, isn't that lovely? Mm -hmm. End of story. And, you know, you fast forward to 2017, and uh, and there is a big hoo-ha. So I think there is... Um, I think the way that we talk about shield maidens can teach us a lot about the society that we live in. Okay. Um, in, in what way? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So back in 1901, gender roles weren't in flux. Um, and I think in a way they were fine with there being shield maidens in the Viking Age because that wasn't a threat to the social order of the time. But now we are experiencing a lot of change in how people perceive and talk and experience gender. And that, mm -hmm. I think, reflects into academic debates, which become very polarized and very problematic very soon. And I wonder if some at some level there isn't sort of a feeling of established knowledge, knowledge systems under threat, and that might play into the reactions that, um, that have come against that kind of stuff. But I don't know. I have not actually researched this specifically, so mm -hmm. I should probably not talk too much. <laughs> I mean, I haven't researched it either, but I'm familiar with with the feeling of the established knowledge system seemingly being feeling threatened. Yeah, because I guess in 1901, that would not have been the case. I mean, women were women, men were men. There wasn't anything in between. There was no, no academics had to feel threatened by that knowledge when it came up. Whereas now, I think people do feel threatened and you have to ask why. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you, uh, I mean, I I guess I've only really been in all of this world, whatever you want to call it, um, maybe 10, nine years, but really into it, like five years. Um, and that's around sort of the time of, like, there's been this rapid change in the world. There's been a lot of... Um, like a huge sort of feminist movement, I guess if that's the right term for it, I don't know. Um, and do you think that whilst that's kind of happening, there is this historical figure of, of shield made and strong... I mean, the Vikings are fucking cool to anybody. They're just cool out there. So then when you get like this strong female figure in that, is that then um, really, uh, from a female perspective, like really, it's like this figure you can kind of look at that's very just all empowering in this amongst this really cool time period anyway so you can kind of just get behind it very easy does that make I sense i don't really know um i think it's complicated uh i overuse that word quite a lot but i it's true though mm -hmm. it is complicated it, it, it is the tagline of the podcast that, so but also worry. i think that you're straying into the do people like shield maidens because they want women in the past who've been strong and i'm like yes but there were shield maiden so it's not mm. a case of wanting it's a case yeah. of talking about stuff that we haven't been able to talk about before because it's been shut down so bj581 uh it was sociologically assessed in the 1970s people have known it was a woman for quite some time okay um but it took a dna analysis and an internationally peer-reviewed article to get people talking is, is that because um the... I don't actually know why it wasn't published earlier, but um, I'm guessing there's something to do with reception, maybe. Yeah, that's why, that's kind of what I was going to ask yeah. is whether it was down to the people who were going would publish it uh, just kind of dragging their heels because it's um, maybe not in line with what they think. I don't know how that that all works and whether I that's even. I wouldn't like to speculate um, to be honest, but. Um, uh... yeah. I feel like that's I wouldn't like to speculate on air and so <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but I guess I, the the question before was do, I mean does it even really matter whether there was she maidens uh historically to modern day women is it like just this really kind of cool iconic figure that just holds its own thing in modern culture that's just become this really kind of symbol of 
symbol of power, I guess, to people who are interested in this and just that yeah, that really I badass think... female figure. And obviously, I imagine that the TV show Vikings and the lag of the figure really helped of like this just this badass female character that you don't get you're seeing more in popular culture now but you you don't you know it, it certainly when i was a kid there wasn't that many apart from um buffy. But, but yeah buffy buffy <laughs> was one sarah, sarah connor was the best though yeah no, she I was uh, sarah connor and then sigourney weaver and alien like oh, ridley yeah. and it's yeah. like she was she was a badass yeah yeah, no, I think, oh, I don't know, actually. I mean, it's very, you're straying into things that, you know, we could talk for hours and, and we'd be moving very far from Nordic mythology. Cause, we uh... have. <laughs> I'm sorry. We, we do that. We do yeah, that. Okay. So <laughs> this, is, this is what I told you earlier today, Marilu, when it's just it's organic. Very good. <laughs> no, I, I mean, yes, there is something to be said for that, but, um, but then you're into the whole do do women have to be like men for us to take them seriously uh and obviously okay, they right, yeah. shouldn't have to mm -hmm. and so i i'm guilty of it as well i scoff at uh at traditional knowledge production of the viking age which puts women in the kitchen i'm like oh my god women did more than just cook and clean but then actually that is true they did do more than cooking and cleaning but cooking and cleaning are vital vitally important things without which society can't function so it's also mm -hmm. something about our presentist gaze that refuses to acknowledge the importance of um, maintenance activities, where we're like, we can only take a woman seriously if she's buried with a sword because a cooking pot to us doesn't tell us anything about power. But actually, I think cooking pots in the Viking age were very powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something that we need to address. But I'm as guilty of this as the next person. I got get really excited when women are found with weapons. I, I love it. I really do. I wish I could get just as excited about cooking pots, and I'm going to work on that. Yes, I think, you know, what we're doing here is, um, again, telling very partial stories where, where we are only taking people in the past seriously when they conform to our ideas of power, and our ideas of power are very closely bound up with violence, mm -hmm. which is problematic. But do you think that excitement comes from when, when women are found with weapons, it's almost like a... These are my words, not yours. Uh, I kind of like fuck you to the to the man, as in like, oh, yeah, a, totally. like yeah, they're like yeah. this is this is something that that was seemingly like suppressed and didn't get put out there. Um, so it's that opportunity. Whereas like, if you find a, a a woman with a cooking pot, it's like oh well, yeah, that's yeah. not that's not as like kind of. So yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with getting excited. No, by no, it. no, no. I mean, there is certainly a fair bit of that, and there's also a lifetime of getting annoyed with people telling me what to do. So yeah. you know, it's like nobody will tell this liking woman what to do. And I that get that. Um, I'd get excited if we found a man with a cooking pot. Have we done that? Is that a oh, thing? Oh, yeah, many. Oh, we, yeah. Many I, women. I with love cooking. Pots. Actually, cooking kitchen equipment is as common in male Viking Age graves as it is in female. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. See? Um, okay, I have <laughs> two questions left. Margaret, do you have any? Do you have any? I feel like I've. I've completely overtalked this episode. I'm so sorry, but you haven't over talked to me at all. I'm just enjoying this conversation. Okay, <laughs> just Very having good. so much fun. Um, I don't have any questions off the top of my head. Uh, so, but if I think okay. of any, uh, I'll let you know. I have two, and then obviously we will do our little Q and A after. Uh, one silly, one might be quite long. So we'll go with a silly one first. Right. Um, do we have any female burials with weapons uh, that have like those little uh, chainmail bikinis that we see so so often is that like a thing <laughs> do, do we know where that comes from did you just <laughs> ask my question there <laughs> oh, no, we really do we have tons of them but you know what we just <laughs> have to publicize them so that people won't get too excited so <laughs> is that is that that's just a modern thing is it that's uh, it's just as common thing. as horned helmets actually yeah so okay. to my knowledge there is only one chainmail found from a Viking Age burial at all. And I could be wrong, but I only know of the one, and that is um, a very famous Yadmundu burial where the, the only known Viking helmet was found as well. So okay. yeah, from Norway, seven. Viking helmet from Norway. From Norway. And really interestingly, I'm just going to say this before you get to ask your next question. So that is a, uh, a, a gendered male grave, but it was buried in a long mound, and long mounds are traditionally associated with women. I'm not saying it was a woman, but I'm saying that it's something we should be discussing. Ambiguity, da 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 da. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, okay, so I, my takeaway from that was that all the bikinis were made from leather. So yes, we just didn't find were. them. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And then they had little nipple tassels. Oh, okay. 
Okay, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that's what those shield bosses actually are. They're just kind of like <laughs> burlesque. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that were just attached with leather straps. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm... Yes. Because, you know, there are shields found in female graves, but we've only found the shield bosses, and now we know why. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There we yeah. go. Yeah. Great. Uh, okay. My last one, which it could be, could be a long one, but we didn't even get to talk about the Osberg women. You're going to have to come back and talk to us again in the future. This, this, this has been a lot of fun. Um, what do you think the average experience of a, of a, a woman in the Viking age would be? Cause I, we mentioned before about how there is this, I feel like a romanticized version of it, that it was like very, equal down the down the middle the women yeah. were held kind of like with the same rights as men and it was just like this utopian society and, I, and i've always wondered like how true that is how not very <laughs> okay can, can we expand <laughs> no again when it comes back to, to status so like what's an average woman okay. the problem is that the stories we tell are based on those elite graves that we have so we only know the stories from the people who made written sources or who have lasting monuments built after their death and those are not the average people mm -hmm. um i think i think if you're talking about an, an an average woman living in a partnership on a farm with an extended family and lots of children it was probably quite hard and also i think one thing that we tend to disregard in this world of you know zoom and podcasts and tv i was thinking about it the other day it must have been really dull Oh yeah. Think of the hours of boredom. Oh. How dark they, it was. Yes. And so they told stories and they sat around the fire, but I mean that just sounds very, very grim. Do you think they um, got bored the same way we did though? Because I uh, so No wonder they started carving shit. No, they exactly. carving shit. What are you gonna do? Uh, so I, I went on holiday um with my wife at the time up to um in is it till tin till in Oz, uh, in Norway, a tin, mm -hmm. is it tin? It's just about an hour and a half mm -hmm. up from Oslo. Um, what? I think it's called tin, the little place. Uh, I didn't make this up. Um, no, no. And <laughs> I definitely went there anyway. What the place was called? It's a be. real place, I promise. <laughs> I'm just gonna try okay. and check it now and see if I'm. Was um, it boring? Is that what you're trying to say? So, uh, yeah, tin uh, municipality. Okay. Uh, it's in Telemark County. Oh, yeah. Is it with apparently. two N's? Two N's, yes. Ah. Um, so we went we went up there and I thought it would, it would be really sweet for us to get like a cabin uh up in the in the mountain. It was only for one night as well, because we, we stayed in Oslo. But went up there for one night. Um and there was no electricity. The toilet was like outside in our house. Uh there was no running water. The water was like just little containers that were in there. I was like, this will be really sweet and romantic. Hashtag authentic. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we like it was lovely, but it was also I think it was like February, yeah. so oh. it got dark really early, yeah. uh, and we were like, oh, let's light these candles. They're not very practical for seeing, so we just like I think we like just got into bed at like eight o'clock and watched up on the iPad. Oh, how very <laughs> modern of us! <laughs> and I was like, wow, this really ro like sweet romantic thing just turned into complete boredom. <laughs> Actually, that sounds pretty good. Going to sleep at eight o'clock. Should do that uh -huh. more often. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, I think we underestimate that. But then also, um, but, well, I have I have a lot of things that I um I have a lot of agendas. One of one of the things that I'd really like is to introduce an archaeology of boring. So I do think that we exotify like exoticize mm -hmm. the past and we tell these stories yeah. about how great it was. And but no, you know, what? at the end of the day, people went to bed and then they slept and they didn't. And maybe if they were a woman of a certain age, they had hot flashes and they had to get up in the night. And then what if you had to get up in the night and go to the toilet? But anyway, um, that's, by the way, point being, they went to sleep, they got up in the morning, they had a little wash, they made some food, they did their chores. I think the majority of existence was pretty routine and probably mm -hmm. quite dull in many ways. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I want to do an archaeology of everyday boring stuff where you emphasize things like the routine stuff that people did. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, yeah that just doesn't get made into tv shows does it it's just no not... it doesn't it really doesn't it's not the jazz hands look at this amazing burial and it's not funky it's just like yeah. really dull and i don't know but, what they used for toilet paper but we should find out 
But at the same time, wouldn't that, if that research did exist, wouldn't that then make such TV shows that much more accurate if the I little love- dull stuff in between, in between the dialogue sequences, da, 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 it's, you know, oh, no, they the did stuff. Just think of your day, and I don't, I don't know, maybe this is just me, but I would say about 95% of my conversations are deathly dull, even to myself. Mm-hmm. So imagine what it's like to people listening. It must be horrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I don't know what that. you mean. My my conversations with my dog are extremely intelligent at all yeah. times. Dog. <laughs> yeah, mine's just shouting at Rocco. So yeah, he's so but, you know. he's, he's so sleepy, bless him. Um I'm sure he'll jump up on my knee in in the, the second part. Um yeah, like, okay, like, let's wrap this up and then we will yeah, sorry. let let people ask you some questions in the Oh no, no, this is the a, a weekly occurrence, Mayana. Okay, <laughs> um, so so yeah, we'll um yeah, we'll 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 wrap up, let people ask some questions, and I I, I would love for you to come back in the future. I've, I've, been, I've enjoyed this a lot. You're this was so much fun. And I, yeah, I also you... just wanted to ask one question as kind of like a wrap up question. Mm. If if you could, how would you summarize how we deal with gender in the Viking Age? Oh, oh, sorry. Yes. No, no. So this is this is a long and convoluted explanation. I have a toy. It's called a boppet. Do you know what a boppet is? Yeah, I'm no, a kid from like a bobblehead. No, no, it's like it's a handheld game that you and it has little controls Bop that it. you need to twist it, twist it, pull it. And yeah. then you right. get points for how long you carry on. And if you don't do very flick it, see somebody yeah, comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you don't do very well, mine shouts at me and goes, Do it the same, but better. Okay, and uh, yeah. yeah, that's what I've got to say about gender in the working. <laughs> nice. I did not expect that answer. So and answers like that are exactly why you Amazing. welcome back at any point. <laughs> Uh, no, it's been it's been a lot of fun. It's always nice when we get somebody who this is no shade to any guest in the past. So please don't take it away. But who um, ha, like has the scholarly intellect, but also is very chatty and um, not not all scholars are. Um, no. so, not all scholars are created equal. That, that's very true. <laughs> Some uh, of them are much better scholars than I am, but I am happy to talk shit. So um, they're not, well, that's, you know. <laughs> It's, it's we need we good. need us too. Yeah, you need people <laughs> with uh, personalities and opinions. They make the world more fun. Um, so yeah, we've been lucky. Most like most scholars are very chatty and they're they're fun. But there has been some in the past that have been that I've struggled with. Uh, and you're never... going off on a tangent now again, just so you know, in case you were thinking about closing off the episode. I know, I'm getting myself in trouble as well. Uh, okay, yeah. okay let, let, let's wrap it up and we'll let people ask some questions. Um, Marion, do you have anything that you want to point people towards, any sort of like public out persona, Social media channels like, and yeah, academia, social media. like if... Do you, are there are there any places that you want people to go to if they want to like if they're curious about your work or what you do? Oh, much uh, better. Yeah, you. well, yeah, I've, I've got an academia page. It's not very up to date, but uh, most of my stuff is on there. But you know, there's lots of great stuff coming out on different ways of thinking about the past at the moment. But um, yeah, off the top of my head, I think I won't bombard people with you know long academic references, and I'm not good with like social media, yeah. so. Yeah. Perfect. No. One last last question. <laughs> when is that uh gender encyclopedia book that I know that you've been working on coming out? Oh right. We do with... we have gendering the Nordic past that should be out yep. the this summer. And then there's a, a handbook of gender archaeology coming out. But that will be less okay. Viking and more general. Gendering the no, Nordic past is quite Viking. And that's coming out on Breffles later on this year. Okay. Well, let's schedule in for you to come back when that comes out. Very good. I'm you know, also happy to chit chat about sacrifice. Oh yeah, and- we do. I don't why I don't know why this came to mind. Then I was like, "You'll be a fun to- person to talk about sacrifice with." <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> "No, but for real though." Yeah, <laughs> I, you, I feel like you'll just be a fun person to, to do that with. So let's yeah, let let's, yeah. let's definitely do that. We'll I'll speak with Bob and or who booked this one? Was it? I'm going off again. Uh, we it can talk was, about this uh, off air. It was Bob and me. I pitched okay. it to Bob, and then Bob reached out. 
Okay, yeah, let's let, we will definitely do sacrifice because that is one that fascinates me, and it probably does tie into to this because there is some mistreatment of women in there as well. Oh, there is, yeah. but then there's oh no no I won't I won't start because then we'll let's be not spoil it. No no but, no, no, um, let's not spoil no. It. Um, okay, Margaret, we'll keep that for the Patreon only section. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, yeah. So there you go. Get over to the the Patreon, uh, Patreon for us, Nordic Mythology Podcast, please. <laughs> Margaret, where can people find you? Instagram as usual, RQ Mags, RQ with a K. Perfect. Uh, and then for me, it's Daniel and Scott Farron, one or at Horns of Odin, and then just Nordic Mythology Podcast on all the different platforms. Um, if you'd like to see all our pretty faces, it's on the YouTube. Um, yeah, there's there's a, it adds a little bit to it, I think, when you can see us. So do go and check that out and hit the little bell and subscribe button and all that stuff. But yeah, thank you very, very much, Marianne. This has been a lot of fun. And yeah, let's let people ask you some questions. 